Hey again! Wow, it's been four weeks already? That rotation sure does go fast, doesn't it? Well, looks like we're talking about Zuerza itself again. That's okay. There's lots to talk about. I think I'm gonna cover some more mechanics I've been working on this time, and next time we'll start getting into the different playable species that exist in the game. And then start meeting the classes you can play as and how those work. But that's later. As stated, this time, mechanics. Ooh, spooky. Now I've been asked about the reasoning behind why I'm building these the way I am. Like, why these mechanics? And why are they built in this particular way? So, this will go a little bit in depth here. So... To start with, one of the mechanics I was overhauling this week was the concept of the stat feed system. Like, in most games you have, like, you need 10 strength to use a Warhammer kind of dealie. If you have 10 strength, then you can wear a full plate, a full visor to helmet, a Warhammer tower shield, and all this other stuff. But none of it slows you down any. Uh -huh. This actually makes it kind of hard to balance the various items. Yes, you have a simplified balance system, and that, you know that at strength 10 you can use X item, but that's only on a localized scale. I mean, it's good for balancing one single item at a time, it's pretty much worthless for balancing a character's entire item loadout against itself as a whole. So, enter stat feeds. This mechanic was taken partially from the game Hellgate London, a game made by the dev team that created the original Diablo, but which didn't go quite so well. They had some really great ideas in it, but the thing mostly flopped. The idea of stat feeds, however, was one of the real gems in there, but they didn't balance it very well and it wasn't put to its full potential use, so it's been updated significantly. So. What is a stat feed, you might ask? Well, the basic concept is that you have 20 strength, then you have 20 strength to allocate towards all of your items in total. That Warhammer costs 10? Alright, so does the tower shield. That's another 10. Well, now you're out of strength, so I guess you won't be wearing blade mail, huh? The reason this is so useful, just from a designer's perspective, is that I can balance a character's entire item loadout at the same time, as well as individual items. If you want a ton of heavy armor, then you're probably going to have to settle for a weaker weapon and so on, because you simply run out of stats to maintain all of it at the same time. Now, I've been working with the mechanic a fair bit these past few days, and it has become a lot more useful of a balance tool for me. And it's become more interesting as a concept as well for players, as we'll see in a moment. One of the biggest changes was to allow players to go into overfeed, uh, the point where they have more total stat feed than they have total stats to throw around. This comes with some notable penalties, but going a point or two over your maximum may be a reasonable choice if you really, really want that tower shield after all. This essentially lets you use gear before you can use it comfortably, but you can use it early, at a cost. Another change was I was originally just going to have strength, anima, and willpower feeds. I have since added agility feed as well. This wasn't originally going to be a thing because of how potentially powerful agility was, with its effect and AP values, but with its effect and action point values. But I've since realized it's a good way to balance things like dual wielding, which now has a 10 agility feed. In this way, almost anyone can pick up and sort of flail about with two clubs, but if they want to use something that requires actual precision, like a pair of daggers, that's much more complex task to achieve. Now, one thing you may notice, or probably not since you don't know what these stats do yet, 
but the strength, agility, and anima statistics are all offensive related. Strength is paired with vitality for raw endurance, agility and reflexes are related to offense and defensive speed, kinda sorta. While anima and willpower influence your ability to exert your mind externally on the world and prevent the external world from overtaking your mind and kind. As such, it's a little odd in that none of the defensive stats directly influence your ability to wear defensive armor and such. Tiny exception there being that the willpower feed is specifically there for controlling really powerful artifacts so that they don't basically drive you insane. Now, the reason behind this is partially that it makes more intuitive sense with the stats as they're presented. But on a balance note, I don't really want someone just stacking absurd amounts of vitality and therefore stacking both maximum health as well as upping their defensive power at the same time. See, players who like offensive stats will have a tendency to just slap on bigger weapons when given the option, so it's not as big of a deal there because they're getting something which can be allocated to offense or defense and the damage characters will tend to opt for more offense in between the two. If they don't, then I'm not really concerned because they're giving up potential offensive power to be more hybridized in between the two, so... Uh, no big deal? Defenses scale a little bit slower than offense, so you don't get into a stalemate, and so that combat keeps going at a fairly quick pace. I want fast visceral combat, where even in just a few short turns you can bring down even a giant golem that can rip castles apart with its bare hands if the whole party concentrates fire upon it. Another issue is that by spreading the stat feeds across all the primary damage stats, this also means that basically every character is more or less kinda balanced against one another by default. 10 agility is about on par with 10 strength more or less, and though they may work differently to one another, they're similar enough that I can compare the two easily. For damage output calculations, the defensive stats are already balanced against the offensive stats in that you get defensive bonuses from the stats automatically without having to balance it onto item loadout, or as in when vitality is pretty much good for 100 total base hit points by default without needing to mess around with balancing it in between offense and defense. Now, there's a few things that can be done thanks to this setup, one of which are advanced armor types, which require a lot more than the normal amount of stat VTs, which even have unique penalties for not having some buffer room. Uh, one such example I've been working on is interlocking plate mail, which is partially mechanical armor which can be locked in place during a bracing action to impede the wielder's movement, but in so doing makes them far harder to harm than even normal full plate. The way this is expressed in the game mechanically at the moment is that if your interlocking plate is locked, you have to expend several action points currently, so that 4 AP, before you can even move at all. If your maximum strength feed is above the total needed for all your gear combined, each extra point reduces the extra AP cost by 1 down to 0, which allows for greater mobility and ease of use of this more difficult to wear advanced armor. Another thing this lets me do is allow for some more unique weapon restrictions for particularly complex weapon types, like one of the base weapons you'll be able to use is a meteor hammer, as essentially a heavy weight, sometimes with spikes at the end of a long chain, where you build up momentum by winding it in long swinging arcs around your own limbs. This kind of a setup requires both a great deal of raw strength, as well as a large amount of agility to keep it moving in a defensive pattern while winding up for an attack. And the strength feed lets me balance this between the two together, along with armor at the same time. I can also work in specific maneuvers which temporarily increase the feed stats for more difficult uses on 
some of the particularly complex weapon types. So, it's a very versatile tool all around for game balance, letting there be a greater variety in how different weapons and armors act. One other really handy thing is that it lets me directly tweak particular materials. So, for example, adamantite's dense and heavy, very powerful stuff for making armor out of, but it's gonna have a much higher strength feed as a cost for that effectiveness. Something like Mithril may be more powerful, not just because of its raw stats it has, but because the effective stat feed is so much lower. From a design perspective, this helps me custom tailor a wide variety of materials, and make them each uniquely valuable at different tasks. Perhaps that same adamantite is excellent for crushing damage because of the sheer mass it packs. Well, mithril's are really mediocre materials to make a maze out of. This is something I haven't fully gotten into yet, but I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do with it when I get into actually writing out the mechanics for and such. So, well, that's the sad feet daily, but since we're on itemization, I've been doing a lot of updates to itemization skills and knockback this week as well. Ah, uh, for starters, weapons now have innate properties. Biggers innately increase in critical strike damage, bows can be fired indirectly at targets without line of sight and penalty to the attacker's skill rank. Claw weapons automatically add a stack of bleeding every time they successfully deal damage to a target. Uh, scythes siphon off a portion of the enemy's health when damaging them. Swords are innately better at parrying. Uh, siege crossbows can punch through walls to hit targets hiding behind them, while mauls are ideal for just bashing someone into a wall to help them with their pancake cosplay. These are just a few of the innate properties, but it should give a good idea of where I'm going with this. The reasoning is simple in that I want to help differentiate weapons from one another. Uh, 1d8 axe and TNT is functionally identical to a 1d8 damage sword, which has always really irritated me. There's no difference between them. So along with damage types, attack speeds, and weapon type specific skills and abilities, these innate properties will help specific weapon types to match players' favorite playstyle better by letting them mix and match what they want to do or heavily investing in a particular path. You may have noticed I mentioned siege crossbows and walls, but these enjoy playing with destructible terrain as well. Well, there's a reason to that. See, that thing I said earlier about wanting visceral combat is quite true. These aren't just generic soldiers, but rather heroes that can take down dragons and such. Or, to use the term more often used for such, big damn heroes who fight big freaking enemies as well. If you up the general strength of the players, they always have to be at a disadvantage to keep things interesting, so the enemies have to be that much more powerful as well. In the meantime, this means stuff like objects in the world that get caught in the crossfire don't tend to fare so well. So how do I handle this? Pretty easily, actually. Different materials have a different amount of hit points per cubic meter, or one square on the map. If you hit a wood wall, it might have 100 hit points. A stone wall may have 200 hit points. As you deal damage to the wall, it falls apart and you can go through it. Yay! These objects also have damage reduction, like if you fire your siege crossbow through a wall, it basically reduces the amount of damage that the wall reduces damage by. So it negates its armor factor. So you can punch right through and go to the other side. Uh, you can also knock people into objects. Like, imagine you're just standing there leaning your back against a stone wall, and then someone takes a sledgehammer to your chest. Aside from the fact that you'll make for a wonderful impersonation, uh, splattering buckets of paint on a canvas after that, it's going to hurt both you and the wall in the process. How this is handled is pretty simple. Every one meter you should move in a direction, but can't do 
to obstacles blocking the way, deals 50 damage to both you and the obstacle. If you should get knocked by 4 meters and the ball has 100 hit points, then you and the ball both take 100 damage, and then you go flying 2 meters past it since the ball took a good chunk of the momentum for you. This keeps it nice and easy uh, to keep track of, like all you'd have to do is set down like little dots or uh, reminders. Some sort of token, like set four tokens on a stone wall, remove one for every 50 damage it takes, there you go, easy. Now, this helps to meet my goal of highly tactical gameplay. Closer to the roots of Final Fantasy Tactics or Disgaea, rather than the war game roots of most RPGs. And it also emphasizes the goal of having positioning play a much bigger role than in most games. Just having lots of stats won't win a fight so much. It can even be odds. But where you stand and what choices you make are more important than the plus X bonus to your die roll, or the roll of the dice. These definitely can play a major role make for more interesting challenges to overcome, or more interesting stories when things go horribly, horribly right. But the majority of the outcome is decided by players' choices, rather than their raw stats or luck. In particular, this means that if a player wants to do some wild, insane but awesome, then it's probably going to benefit them far more substantially than in a game where it just counts as a generic plus 3 bonus to hit or something. Anyway, knocking enemies into walls or through them, or just having a frothing at the mouth berserker literally punch her way through a wall with her bare hands kinda gives a visual style of combat. Everything that happens is exaggerated a bit and almost slightly cartoonish format to help really sell that stuff is happening with everything that goes on, and helps make more vibrant descriptions of the carnage. You don't just attack, you charge across the battlefield and shoulder check that bastard who wanted to hit your priest and ram them right into a wall. That'll learn him to touch your healer. Hey, that sounds a lot like a skill. Yep, another major change this week is to skill mastery. I wasn't really happy with how Skill Mastery basically acted as a plus X stat modifier, and it kind of bugged me. I also wasn't happy with how abilities, once you learn them, don't really tend to improve over time as you gain additional skill. Well, now both of those problems have been solved. Hallelujah, it's a ring man. Keep the Kayla away from the catapults from now on, thank you. I don't care if it breaks the enemy's morale, I don't want to have to clean that up afterward. Anyway, the idea here is that each skill rank you learn also comes with an ability of some sort. Some are passive, some are charge abilities, some are standard abilities which use action points, what else? The important part is that they didn't use to change once you learn them. Now, every ability also lists a mastery effect. Each skill rank above the required amount needed to unlock the ability, if you have skill mastery for that skill, also further affects the ability in some manner. So, uh, for example, a knockback ability with a maw may deal some damage and knock a target back 3 meters by default. Pretty good stuff in and of itself and unlocks at rank 3. If you have skill mastery now though, that same ability gets better at ranks 4, 5, and 6. In this particular case, the ability in question increases the knockback by up to plus 1 meters for each additional skill rank. So rank 4 ups to 4 meters maximum knockback, then 5 meters, then 6 total. You don't have to use the upgraded ability, since maybe you only want to knock them back 3 meters into line with another enemy. So you can cut it off at 3 meters still if you want, or anywhere between 3 to 6, giving you a bit more for options and fine-tuned control over things. Oh yeah! And malls do double damage when they bash someone into a wall as their innate effect. 
Is that 50 damage from the ball would normally take when you get knocked into one? Is instead up to 100 total damage for each meter you'd go flying, but didn't. Fun synergy! And it means even though crushing damage doesn't tend to scale that well, it does punch through armor easily. And apparently walls. But I'm dish. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm not. Anyway, the point is that these expanded masteries have the potential to make abilities a lot more interesting and give players added control. Even the most of them will still technically be just a plus X modifier. I can manually adjust the specific details to each ability accordingly, allowing for some unique and fun effects. So yeah, that's some of what I've been working on for Say Horse itself lately, and the reason behind it. And with that, I'm out. I'll see you next time!